Good morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to this virtual service of worship here at Knox United Church in Kenora, Ontario. My name is Bruce Graham. My preferred pronouns are he and him, and I will be your worship leader for this Sunday, October the 17th worship service. I'm very happy to report that last Sunday, Thanksgiving Sunday, we held our first in-person worship service since March 15th of 2020. We are holding in-person worship again today, but we have also decided to continue with our virtual worship services. This is to accommodate those who may not yet feel comfortable returning to in-person services, and also for those who choose to join us from places other than Kenora. So, whether you have already sat through this service in person this morning, or you are watching it for the first time, know that you are welcome, and that we are together in spirit, if not in body. I wasn't able to attend our in-person worship service last weekend. Emily and I went to Calgary to visit Madeline for Thanksgiving. While we were there, we went for a hike in the Grotto Canyon Trail, about an hour west of Calgary. The pictures I am using throughout the service today are from that hike. And I have included them because when I look at them, they bring to mind two of the readings from this week's lectionary. In Job 38 at verse 4, God asks, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? And in Psalm 104 at verse 5, the psalmist says of God, He set the earth on its foundations, it can never be moved. Witnessing the, the beauty and the sheer magnitude of God's magnificent creation during this hike made me realize how utterly small and fragile each one of us is, and how grateful we each should be for the comfort and support of God's unending love and grace. As we prepare to enter into this time of worship, let us hold silence as the Christ candle is lit. Please join me in our call to worship. This is a responsive. I will read the lines in white, and if you feel so inclined, you can respond with the lines in yellow. God stretches out the heavens and shapes the earth. Come and give thanks. God raises up the mountains and pours water into the seas. Come and give thanks. God calls forth plants from the soil and forms animals in infinite variety. Come and give thanks. God, 
God breathes upon us and fills us with life, come lift your voices in praise. God gives our lives meaning through laughter and tears, come lift your voices in praise. God touches our hearts through family and friends, come lift your voices in praise. God loves us and blesses us with everything good, come and worship. God loves us and overwhelms us with never-ending generosity, come and worship. God loves us and surrounds us with love and in abundance, come and worship. Let us pray. We do not pray in order to alleviate our guilt, but to express our gratitude to God. For we know all the things we have said and done that we shouldn't, and all those words we could have spoken, all those actions we could have undertaken, but did not. Despite such lives, God still loves us surrounding us with mercy and hope, waiting to restore us to new life. Please join me as we pray together, saying, Creation's heart, we look around and see how we fall short in our attempts at faithfulness. We often do things not because it is what you call us to do, but in hopes of earning points with you. We can become so self-absorbed we cannot see the suffering and struggles of friends, family, strangers. We are so desperate to get to the front of the line, we push aside the very ones you seek to honor. Forgive us, Holy One. Remind us that the cup we are offered overflows with grace, 
that the waters of baptism cleanse and make us new, and that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is the one who calls us to service, standing by our side as we seek to be faithful disciples. The one who poured the foundations and creation fills us with grace and hope. The one who numbered the clouds tips over rain barrels of living water into our parched souls. The one who writes anthems for the early morning stars fills us with songs of joy. The one who provides food for all living things feeds us with mercies which come fresh and new each day. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. And now let us pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. This is the point in our service where we would traditionally stand and greet each other with the peace of Christ. So I invite you, if you are with friends and family, to do that now. And if not, know that in spirit we greet each other. May the peace of Christ be with you and the response and also with you. As we prepare to hear scripture, let us pray. God of creation, as we hear the words of scripture read this morning, we pray that our experience goes beyond mere hearing. We pray that through your grace, these words will not only be heard, but understood as well. We pray that through your spirit, we will be moved into action to love and serve others as Jesus showed us. We pray that our hearts are open to compassion so that the troubles of others become our troubles as well. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you have ever been in a position where you have had to correct a person's performance or behavior, to provide constructive feedback. This could have been as a sports coach, as a supervisor in your work, as an instructor or trainer in some capacity, or even as a parent. You have likely been taught to use the sandwich method. If you're not familiar with it, it goes like this. 
You start off by telling the person something positive, something they are doing well, the good news, if you will. Then you tell them what it is that needs correction or improvement, the bad news. And then you finish by again telling them something they are doing well, more good news, sandwich. The thinking behind the, using this approach is that if you open with something positive, you'll get the person's attention and they will be more engaged in the conversation. That way they will be more likely to hear and register the information you give them for whatever it is that you feel they need to improve or correct. And then by finishing on a positive note, you remove any possible hurt feelings that may have been inflicted by your bad news. The expectation is that the person will heed your advice and will make the necessary corrections to their performance or behavior, and you will see positive results. It all sounds good in theory, but in actual practice, studies have shown that it doesn't really work. What tends to happen is that the person hears the positive comments on either end, the good news, and they tend to tune out or ignore the not so positive part in the middle, the bad news. Imagine if you wanted your young child to clean their room. Using the sandwich approach might sound something like this. You've been so well behaved lately. That's the good news. Why don't you clean up your room? That's the bad news. And then we can go for ice cream. More good news. What the child is likely to register is, you've been so well behaved lately, we can go for ice cream. Now, I don't know if Jesus ever attended any leadership or coaching seminars or not, but I think in our reading from today, he is struggling with the effects of the sandwich method. Let me read to you the verses that immediately precede our reading from this morning, beginning at verse 33. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Here's the sandwich. We are going up to Jerusalem. That's the good news. The disciples, for the most part, have realized that Jesus is the Messiah. So, according to the ancient scriptures, he is the one who will sit on the throne and rule over Israel. So, the disciples think that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to take his place as king. Good news, right? The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. That's definitely the bad news. Three days later, he will rise. More good news. And that brings us to our reading from today, when James and John, the brothers of Zebedee, approach Jesus and ask him to install them, one at his right hand and one at his left hand, in his glory. It appears that James and John have only heard, or have only chosen to hear, the good news parts of Jesus' speech. Perhaps something like, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will rise. And they want to ensure their place in his kingdom. Places of high position and authority. I mean, they've been with him from the start. They likely feel they've earned this reward. Now, Jesus realizes that they haven't heard or haven't registered everything that he said. So he tries to clear it up for them. You don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? In other words, are you prepared to go through the suffering that I will go through? Are you prepared to accept the death the way that I am prepared to accept death? And the brothers, clearly not understanding what he is implying, simply reply, We can. I can only imagine Jesus' frustration at this point. 
After all, he has taught the disciples about what the kingdom of God will be like. And after all the examples he has given them of how we are expected to love and serve others, they still don't get it. This is the third time that Jesus has told them of his pending death in Mark's gospel. And this is the third time that they have failed to understand his meaning. In chapter 8 at verse 31, Jesus predicts his death and Peter rebukes him. And Jesus tells Peter, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. In chapter 9 at verse 32, Jesus predicts his death and then the disciples argued about who of them was the greatest. And Jesus tells them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And as we have heard this morning from chapter 10 at verse 33, Jesus predicts his death for the third time. And James and John ask for places of honor in his kingdom. So Jesus tries to clear things up one more time. He tells them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life in ransom for many. That's what the disciples have failed to see to this point. The kingdom of God is not about status, power, or authority. The kingdom of God is about service. The kingdom of God is about caring. The kingdom of God is about putting others before ourselves. In Mark's Gospel, the disciples have heard this message three times and are still struggling to understand it. In our lives as Christians, how many times have we heard this message? Do we fully comprehend its meaning? Our society still focuses on status, on the accumulation of wealth, on placing ourselves before others. There is room for improvement in how we are living in God's kingdom. Knowing that the sandwich method isn't especially effective at achieving improvement, we need to be direct with our constructive feedback. In dealing with injustice, we need to do better. In helping the poor, we need to do better. In caring for the sick, the hungry, and the homeless, we need to do better. Interestingly, the accounts of Jesus predicting his death in Mark's Gospel are presented using the sandwich method. On both ends of this section of the Gospel, there are accounts of Jesus healing a blind person. In chapter 8 at verse 22, Jesus heals a blind man at Bethsaida, and in chapter 10 at verse 46, Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus. Both good news events. Perhaps this presentation was intentional, so that if we too failed to comprehend Jesus' message about the kingdom of God, we would at least be left with the thought that Jesus can give sight to the blind. And we can pray that Jesus restores our sight as well, so that we can see those who are in need, so that we can see acts of injustice, so that we can see those who we are to serve, so that we can see through the eyes of Jesus. For then, and only then, will we be able to see the kingdom of God and share in its glory. Thanks be to God. Amen.
This is the point in our service when we would normally pause to think about the abundance of gifts that we have and how we can share those gifts with those less fortunate than ourselves. And even though we are meeting virtually, Knox still has a need for those gifts. And we encourage you to give as you can. Uh, offerings may be sent into the church office. It can be dropped off at the church. Uh, you can join uh, the PAR program and give through that. Uh, give in whatever way that you can and in whatever way you're comfortable. So as we consider our many blessings and how we can share those gifts, let us pray. Dear and loving God, may our gifts lay a foundation of hope for all in despair. May they brighten the shadows of those who wander alone. May they cause the voiceless to join the morning stars in singing your praises. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Savior, may these prayers which we offer you be also a renewing of our contract to love one another, even as Jesus has loved us. We pray for the end of bitterness and violence in its many forms. Bless all peacemakers, those who negotiate between nations or arbitrate within commerce and industry, adjudicate in family courts, diffuse tensions in school grounds, and counsel conflicting parties within church denominations. We pray for the effective, compassionate care of all who are diseased, maimed, or severely handicapped, including ailing members of this congregation. Bless all who work in clinics and hospitals, surgeons, physiotherapists, nurses, physicians, oncologists, psychiatrists, dietitians, social workers, dentists, pharmacists, and the staff of hospices for the dying. We pray for the feeding of the hungry, the clothing of the destitute, the housing of the homeless, the reformation of prisoners, and the rehabilitation of those who have been addicted to drugs. Bless every agency, church, or government which is dedicated to the care of our disadvantaged sisters and brothers. We pray for the provision of systems of justice that are truly fair, whether they are within our homeland, in other nations, or international courts of justice, may those who are brought to court find equality before the law. Bless with insight and integrity each barrister and judge, work in the mind and soul of every juror, that the innocent may be exonerated and the hearts of those sentenced turned towards repentance and regeneration. We pray for the church, for all denominations, large or small, that we may love one another in practice as well as in prayer. Bless all joint initiatives in worship, fellowship, and service to the community. May the world know that there is a grace at work in us which is not our doing, but a gift from a lover who outstrips all others. Through Christ Jesus, our humble Lord. Amen.
Go in peace, love and care for one another in Christ's name. Go in the confidence of people who have found mercy through him, keeping the commandments and letting go of all that binds you to the ways of this world. And may God come close to you and keep you safe. May Christ Jesus reward your faithfulness a hundredfold. And may the Holy Spirit be your help in time of need, both now and forevermore. Amen.